liberty for every drop of rain that falls a flower grows I believe that somewhere in the darkest night a candle glows I believe for everyone who goes astray someone will I believe above the storm, the smallest prayer will still be heard. I believe that someone in the great somewhere hears Thank you. Uh, Robert Farrago, always good to have you here. And Millie, of course, first Sundays of each month, Millie Edwards is here. So hello, everybody, and welcome. Anybody go to Marianne Williamson last night? And you still made it to church the next day. I'll tell you. Well, I welcome you to Unity Temple in the Plaza, a place where diversity is praised and peace and harmony are the rewards. Before we get uh, into the service, I have a very special announcement from Nancy Addy, the captain of the Garden Fairies. So Nancy, would you please come forward? So not only am I the head garden fairy, I'm one of the best chief fans around, can you tell? Go Chiefs! Woo! Before I say anything this morning, I'm going to have all of my happy little band of garden fairies who are not happy that I'm asking them to do this come up onto the stage with me. So you can truly acknowledge, okay, come on, y'all promised me you would. <laughs> So I don't do this by myself. I have all of these wonderful people here who help me once a Saturday or once a month on Saturdays from about the end of March till yesterday was our last Garden Fairy this year, our season this year. And this year was a really difficult season. Between the heat, the no rain, the early frost, sprinkler issues, we had a really rough time. But I think if you walk by our garden, you can see that these people standing around me they did a great job, and they are here in rain, they are here in the heat, they are here in the snow, they are here in the wind, they, they just don't fail me, and so I'd like to give them a round of applause. Yeah. So normally I would talk to you all about this being the time change day, to bring in your change, but like many things change, the way garden fairies do things has changed also, and now, we have, we're not gonna be passing out the little boxes. You can still bring your change in bags, cans. I don't care what you bring it in, just bring it along. Or you'll see out front now, can you hold this, Nance? 
you can see we have a QR code. This is my Vanna White. Um, we have our QR code now, so it makes it really, really easy to donate. If you take a picture of this, it'll take you right to the Garden Fairies, and if you are an ambassador, it'll take you to your account, and then you can donate to us. 100% of any funds that are collected for the Garden Fairies go to the maintenance of the garden. And this year, we've had some extra expenses with, we had to completely redo our sprinkler um, control box. That was an interesting one, but good news, that's changed also because now I can control it from home with my telephone. Is that too cool? I mean, really, when you think about it. And then I also want to acknowledge two other people, Helen Betts and Christopher Barnes. Those two people have for years now been sponsors of the beautiful pot that we have out on the patio and the two pots that we have that change for the spring and the winter. They have just unfailingly supported the Garden Fairies. So I'd like to thank all of you and if any of you want to get your hands dirty, if say you live in an apartment or a condo, once a month we meet only for an hour because these people here, they are getting so good. We used to meet for two hours, but actually we only meet for an hour now. <laughs> it really goes fast. So um, you can contact us and we'll let you know what to do. Thank you. Appreciate your support. Thank you, Garden Fairies. For some of you who have been around here for some time, before Nancy Addy and the Garden Fairies took over, we basically had a sand lot in front of the church. There was no greenery, there were no flowers, there, there were very few trees and they were dying. And it's just incredible what uh, they have done. We have the most beautiful landscape in the plaza. So thanks again to the, the Garden Fairies. Um, we have John and Virginia here from North Carolina. North Carolina visiting us. They always get those same seats. Welcome. Um, we miss you. We love you. And it's so good to see you here. We'll now begin the service with the Temple Chimes, the opening prayer, Geneva Price, and the call to inspiration. Say this with me, if you please. On this day, we dedicate ourselves to peace on earth. We accept ourselves without harsh judgment and express appreciation for our individuality. We live without fear to meet the events of this day with confidence. We accept others without prejudice to experience a sense of unity with all people. We honor our earthly environment and recognize a oneness with all creation in harmony with ourselves, our lives, other people, and all of nature. We live this day with a peaceful mind, a peaceful heart, and a peaceful spirit. Thank you, God. Amen. God blesses this new day. Each morning the sun rises on a beautiful new day, a day filled with hope. Whatsoever things are good, whatsoever things are true, these are the thoughts we hold this and every day. These are the thoughts we hold this and every day. Merely survive 
and I won't give up this dream of life that keeps me alive. I've gotta be me. Many of you might not know, but we have something very exciting happening here at Unity Temple. When COVID began to um, relieve us a bit, we knew that there was going to be a tremendous backup of funerals and weddings. People that had dates booked before COVID were putting them on hold because they just didn't want large groups of people meeting. So during that time, we decided, well, what can we do to better serve this community? And the two things were weddings and funerals. Now, we're perfectly capable of doing those in this room, but when it came to receptions, we fell a little bit short because our downstairs space just wasn't adequate. It didn't live up to uh, the wedding flair or the memorial for large groups of people. So a single donor came forth and said, I will give you $150,000 as matching fund for the downstairs area. And with that, the people, uh, the church will get it if somebody matches it uh, for a dollar or for $10 or for $10,000. So within three days, we not only matched the 150, we went all the way to 370,000, which puts us in a very wonderful position now as we move forward to uh, not only provide community events for uh, this particular community, but also for weddings and business meetings and all sorts of other things as well. I'd like to give you a glimpse of what's going to take place down there. Downstairs, there'll be um, events such as dinner theater, musical performances, other varieties of entertainment. Uh, we have a complete stage now with lighting and complete sound, which we didn't have before that was all walled up. And, excuse me, with food prepared by culinarian and food educator, Lisa Burgess. Next slide. The stage area in Unity Hall has a full-size screen with a rear projector as for uh, group football games or uh, other important things that we want to um, put on there. Youth and family activities will have a wide variety of events such as youth dances, game night, cooking lessons, da 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 da. Unity Hall presents a perfect setting for weddings, receptions, anniversaries, birthday celebrations, family reunions, and much more. The section can be turned into open space that is conducive for yoga, group meditation, Sufi dancing, Tai Chi. A full service cafe serving locally sourced plant forward cuisine that will also serve as an interactive learning kitchen promoting, per well, I don't need to tell you all this. I'm gonna call the, the, the primary stakeholder uh, with us, our partner downstairs for this Unity Hall thing, that's Lisa Burgess. Lisa, would you please come forward? You tell us what you're all about. What are you doing down there anyway? Yes, sit down. This is Lisa Burgess. She's going to um, 
uh, open the cafe and also a culinary school and also catering and also cooking lessons to the public. So you tell us more about that, Lisa. I would love to if I knew how to turn this on. <laughs> Sorry about that. Testing. Oh, is it working? Okay. Sorry. Thanks, Christopher. Um, can you repeat the question? <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah. What are you doing? <laughs> oh, that one. Okay, so uh, Learning Kitchen, as, we, as Duke just stated, uh, is a food education center. It will house a cafe counter and carry out. And what we mean by that is um, we will have a cafe built out, a long counter for counter seating. The cafe will be open for lunch daily. And then in the evening, uh, and at other times. Um, that long kitchen and counter seating will serve as an interactive teaching and learning kitchen. That's one aspect of it. Another aspect um, will be that we will provide industry-informed training. And what I mean by that is we will um, have an advisory committee of local restaurant professionals that will inform the type of training that we will do for um, eventual staff in their, in their restaurants. So we'll be um, accessing students from all kinds of community organizations. Um, that will be really fun and interesting. Uh, we will also provide the catering for all of the events downstairs in Unity Hall um, and in space. And what am I missing? Um. I don't know, I, if I misspeak, um, please don't interrupt me. Uh, right, I know, <laughs> I already know that. The beauty about this, about the culinary school, are these are kids that probably aren't college material, they have no interest in going to college, but this gives them an opportunity to, to uh, become a professional in a career that involves food service. And when they come, um, come to the school, um, they learn how to sweep the floor properly, they learn how to wash dishes properly, they learn how to bus tables, how to wait on tables. Then they learn how to cook fabulous food. When they get out, they get a degree of achievement, which with Lisa's name on it, because she's known as, as one of the big, um, f she didn't like guru, um, f food person. She's a food person, okay. Uh, anyway, with her um, name on it, they can go to almost any restaurant and get their foot in the door. And if it's if it's a dishwasher, they can work their way up because of this incredible knowledge that they have. Nobody graduates from the school unless they meet the entire criteria. So if they go someplace, the people are guaranteed they're going to get a good person. That pretty much does it. Yeah, that's yeah, pretty okay. good. All right. Uh, one thing I want to ask you. I mean, it's it's kind of a miracle because we we came together um, maybe less than a year ago. And for something totally different. It was dinner's theater and she was going to cater the food for it. And as we talked, um, we both kind of moved down this path of why not opening a restaurant here. And then I vetted her and did some checking around and I got nothing but glowing reports. And so it just kind of gradually evolved without a master plan of what she's going to do and how beautifully that fits in with, with our area. So. I thank you for that, for being a part of this, but also I want to know, now that you've been here for a while, and you've met a lot of people, you're active in a lot of stuff, what, what do you think of these, these people in Unity? Mm. <laughs> Should I start with you? No. Okay. No. <laughs> well, so this came to be, um, I taught high school uh, from 2008 to 2020 and coincidentally retired uh, or it uh, coincided with uh, the pandemic. So the, the last uh, approximate month of my teaching career um, was done virtually. I taught a culinary arts program for a career in technology high school in the Fort Osage School District. So I had juniors and seniors that were with me every day for two and a half hours, five days a week for two years. So by the time they graduated, they had 1,060 hours of culinary arts experience what I didn't know, well, I'll back up. I, I've been in the restaurant business since I was 13. Um, that was my first job, and with grandparents that also did catering. And um, so having done that throughout my career and, and having so many opportunities throughout my career, not just in town, um, uh, but also in other cities, it really, when I started teaching, and I was kind of 
um, a little bit older coming into that field, um, what I realized when I got to the high school was that I wasn't teaching cooking. Um, that was a platform to teach a lot of other, what I consider more important things. While, trust me when I say, I, I think being able to, to understand food and cook your own food is really important, but if that doesn't interest you, other people will do it for you um, if you have the resources. But what I learned was that um, that 2,000 square foot commercial kitchen uh, as a learning platform with juniors and seniors in high school was an enormous opportunity to look at um, not just what we plan to do with our lives, but who we plan to be in our lives. And I think that with the 12 years that followed, um, I became intricately uh, connected to the idea of, of being in a space where learning can happen. And learning can be a very vulnerable act. Um, it's, an, it's an act of reciprocity. Um, but the other even more important thing that I learned is that we had conversations in that classroom about our inner lives, our inner worlds. And I think for me, that act of teaching and learning kind of uh, opened a door to, I guess, for lack of a, a different word, sort of spirituality um, in this way that it was, um, I mean, I, I, I certainly, you know, I went back to school to study teaching, um, to, to do that job, but that the act of teaching was a natural act because it's learning, again, the reciprocity. So what we're creating downstairs is this safe space for learning where that vulnerable act of being wrong and making mistakes, and we're gonna do it with food. Um, maybe when you're eating there, that's not the time that we're gonna be making those mistakes. But um, it provides a learning ground. Um, so it's not just the students coming in that will be trained in skills, although that, that will happen. It's that everybody in that environment um, benefits. We learn to communicate better. Um, Duke does a principal's class on Sunday morning at nine o'clock, in case you'd like to attend. Um, but we were talking this morning about um, kind of levels of conversation. And I, you know, I think teaching contributed to this in me I, ha I ha really have tough with, a tough time with small talk, like surface level kind of conversation. Like I tend to go deep, and uh, not everybody's comfortable with that. Um, but I'm really uncomfortable not doing it, so it puts, you know, it's kind of an interesting spot to be in. But what we talked about, uh, one of the reasons is that that puts you in a vulnerable spot when you start talking about yourself and your, you know, how you feel, what you think, et cetera. Um, but to provide an open space for that, that's also where you're employed, um, I think is, is a step toward well-being and, you know, unity is a center for well-being. Wherever you go in this building, there's something being done that is contributing to our well-being. And I don't know how, you know, I don't know a better way to live than that. So when we started talking, you know, the, the common question, and, you know, Duke, Duke keeps, it, it's now kind of a, a kind of a joke among all of us. What's the name of the restaurant? You know, what's the name of the restaurant that you're doing downstairs? And I have to, I had to come up with a better response than, well, that's not the point, the name of the, like the restaurant's not the point. It is, it, it will be a lovely place to eat and, and the food will be, we call it plant forward or uh, uh, plant rich, but not vegan or vegetarian. Although we will be thoughtful about everything that we serve. Uh, um, humanely raised, organic, local, whenever we can do that, uh, and minimal um, as far as the, the meat products that we, that we serve. So when Duke and I started talking in the very beginning, it was about this dinner theater 
And, and I think the thing that I love the most is that if you look at the conversation a year later, now we're building this amazing thing downstairs. Um, but it started with conversation mm -hmm. and not surface level conversation. The first time we talked, it got interesting. You know, we were talking about things in our lives that really meant something and, and not all of it's pretty. Um, but we connected very quickly in that. And then it became a series of conversations. And then after the first of the year, uh, they, they were looking for somebody to occupy that space downstairs. And I didn't know necessarily that I was ready for a brick and mortar or anything. Um, I was already doing some other things. But uh, that's where it's ended up. And um, I feel like all of the work that I've done so far in food and teaching and then even in self betterment um, has sort of prepared me to now embark on this, which is very much a learning experience for me too. We're making decisions as we go. Um, this is the last thing I'll say about this, but when I, when I said to Duke, Duke asked me if I could have a decision, you know, in February, whether or not I would like to occupy that space. And I, and I said, yeah. So he gave me um, about a month after we had that talk to decide. Um, and I said, you know, wow, I ha you know what just happened to me? What happened to Patty Smith that I told you? I completely forgot what I was talking about just now. <laughs> like, I'm sitting here not yeah, Don't ask me. Moved. What's that? Don't ask me. Okay. <laughs> anyway, the, the thing about it was when we got together, I discovered that in addition to being a wonderful uh, cook, somebody who can t take three or four ingredients and make magic come out of the, uh, the end product. She also had the same values that Unity has and that I have. And her values are, are, are peace and harmony and love and compassion. And that alone gives us a common foundation to build on. Now, I didn't call you here today to talk all about the restaurant, although it's interesting for people, I'm sure. But if you're, um, you're so masterful at, at putting together ingredients so something very successful comes out, I would like to explore uh, developing a recipe for successful living. And in doing that, there's three areas that, that interfere for most of us with our peace of mind and with our, our sense of well-being. And the first is, is just dealing with the world that we're living in right now. I mean, this is a confusing time. It's a chaotic time. It is crazy at times. Uh, it makes the, the, the political um, agenda in with the, the COVID scares and, and all of that stuff, the big changes that have taken place. I am wondering, how do I deal with all that stuff out there without getting uh, upset or confused or disturbed or seeing things that I think shouldn't be happening, yet they are? How do I... How do I um, reconcile myself with that is the way the world is without getting out and trying to change something that is not changeable? And you might have some ideas on that. Hmm. That's an easy one. <laughs> um. Let me rephrase it. <clears throat> when you go out in the world and you see things that seem to be uh, unjust, or things to be uh, um, disrespectful of you or of people that you're with, or you see something on TV that just strikes a chord that this, this just isn't the way the world should be. How do you immunize yourself from that so that you don't get all upset and carry it with you about all these things that we have no power to really control ourselves? That's a great question. I mean, if you're asking how I do that personally, um Man, I throw everything at that. <laughs> I, uh, I have a meditation practice. Um, I'm consistently reading and, and interacting, whether it's in a discussion group or one-on-one -on -one conversations. Um, really, how to take care or change the one thing that I can, um, and that's me my approach, my outlook. Um, you know, from things like uh, Marianne Williamson spoke here last night, and, uh, you know, there were a lot of messages in that talk. One of the big ones for me was that I have to be able, regardless of what you're doing, to be able 
to extend love um, and see the love and light in you regardless of your behavior. So there's all kinds. I mean, you can have affirmations or, or um, meditations that you take throughout your day to calm you in certain times or take a breath and follow your in-breath and out. But for me, uh, learning is the key. If I'm not learning, I get really, I can get ants, I can start to get disturbed. So if something is disturbing me, I guess it's a, it's a sign that I need to learn more about that. Whether it's a person or a situation, whatever it is, I need to go a little bit deeper on that so I can gain some more understanding. And it's amazing what that does. It transforms um, everything. I think about everything, mm -hmm. really. Yeah. I, think, I, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, when I run into a situation that is upsetting or disturbing or something I don't like, the first question that has to be answered, can I do anything about this? Do I have the power and the control to make a change here, or is it something beyond my capacity to, to make a difference with? And if I can't do anything about it, the solution is very simple. You just set it aside. You don't engage in it. You, you release yourself from it, and you continue to move forward. If you can do something about it, then you do something about it, no matter how small. It might be a single step, but still, you're making a, a pathway towards the successful solution in your life. The other thing is, if, if I run into something that's disturbing me and I can't do anything about it, and I get upset, is I ask the second question, why am I reacting this way? Why am I reacting to something that is unchanging and getting upset? And sometimes that'll last for maybe an hour. Sometimes I'll carry it on for a couple days. Um, for some reason, I just feel justified in, in doing that. And um, with those two questions, you have a pretty good idea of what you can do going forward. You need to continue to engage with it and improve it as you go, or you just uh, bless it and, and to prayer, say, um, <clears throat> May, may this matter rectify itself. May this matter be resolved and move forward with the faith, knowing that if it is something that isn't a characteristic of the world that, that uh, is going to be for the betterment of all, that we just allow it to take its own natural course. And uh, eventually that is resolve a resolution in some way. So that is all fine with, with objects out there, inanimate objects. But the second th biggest area that we have that causes 92% of all our problems, and that is other people. Every single thing that we do involves a relationship of some sort, and 92% of the relationships are other people. Whether they're in our family, next door, stranger on the street, it doesn't make any difference. But people can get under our skin, primarily because they're not the way we want them to be, right? Yeah. Well, that's never going to happen. Nobody is ever going to be exactly the way we want them to be. So if somebody is rude or obnoxious or disrespectful or something like that, it's very easy to, to bless them and remove them um, from your presence or remove your presence from them and continue on. There's a lot of people that are, are uh, in harmony with you, that uh, express love, that make you feel good. We don't have to try to psychoanalyze and cure everybody out there that doesn't like us or that criticizes us. So do you have people problems in your life? No. No. <laughs> Just me. Uh, no, it, it's true. And something that I'm learning, well, first of all, I've had such an amazing experience with um, joining the community here and the interactions with the people. Um, you know, Cassie and Jen and Christopher and the board and the, and, um, the building committee and the garden fairies and, and I'm sure I'm leaving people out. Uh, what about me? And also you. Yeah, okay. We'll get back to you in a second. Right. Um, you know, the other thing that I'm learning is nothing. Nothing in life is linear, uh, especially relationships. Y you know, you never, like, well, th I guess this is what I thought. Like, I, it never really, 
I never really thought like I could have strained family relationships or, or you know, like you can get irritated with one another, but that there would ever be a situation that would separate you or. But that's what happens. I doubt there's anybody in this room that doesn't have something like that happening right now. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess it comes back to the same thing. Like you can do, I think it was, yeah, well, I, know, I don't think. It was the great Dolly Parton that says, uh, forgiveness is everything. I mean, when it comes down to it, forgiveness is everything. Um, and it's so hard sometimes. But when you're carrying anger, or you're carrying resentment for another person, or it's so heavy, and it, and it interferes and informs everything you do in your life. Um, and so again, you can't change. Marianne Williams said, Williamson said this to somebody that was asking a question at the end at, during the Q&A last night, and it was a mother who was talking about her grown daughter. And uh, she said, you know, your mother doesn't owe it to you to be the mother that you want her to be. <laughs> and your daughter doesn't owe it to you to be the daughter that you want it to be, want her to be. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, I just really, I, I sort of thought about that last night and insert any name or any relationship. Nobody owes it to you to be the person that you want them to be. But if you change that around, and a big part of Learning Kitchen is, um, cultivating curiosity. If you turn things into, wow, you know, just get curious about somebody, and sometimes you have to do that from afar, if, if it's not an active relationship at the moment or, or whatever, but if you're curious, if I'm curious about other people, um, you know, about how they feel, what they think, and really listen, um, I'm, I'm much less bothered by anything they or I do, really. A curiosity about myself, that's tough when I know we're gonna talk about that in a second, but um, I think that's one of the things that helps us build the, you know, the partnership and the relationship that we're building. Um, I don't expect you to be anything other than someone that just sits right here and, and reciprocates the conversation. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. Um, and it's nice, it's really nice. And, there, and there's a lot of that here. It seems like everybody's kind of on the same page uh, in that way, it's nice. Well, I think one of the things uh, that affected me and probably a lot of you people as well, when we're raised in a traditional religion, you know, we are taught that uh, we're not worthy in the eyes of God, that we're sinful by nature. And we, we have this imaginary um, infliction, spiritual infliction that we're just not good enough that we're not good enough for, for this world or good enough for other people. So when somebody disagrees with us or if somebody has, uh, is disrespectful and they say something, we have a tendency to take it personally. We jump right into it. Well, how can he say that about me? Why would he say that about me? When in most cases it has nothing to do with us. We don't know what led that other person to our doorstep or what that other person has gone through in their life. They might have been raised in an environment that's very critical and very harsh and very condemning. So that's the way they treat the world. That's the way they express themselves. But if it all comes back to why am I feeling this way because of this person who's obviously hurting or has um, some primary issues that uh, are unsettling, why don't I just bless him? And Jesus said that 2,000 years ago. You know, bless your enemy and, and kick the dust off your feet and be on your way. So we have the everyday situations and circumstances that we involve in. We have relationships with other people, which is huge. But the biggest one of all is the relationship that we have with ourselves. I know that I have, and most of you probably have as well, you know, two voices in your head. You have the self, the real self, then you have the condemning self, the, the chatter box. It's like recapping the, the uh, daily news about how not good I am, or every little thing that happens, that critical voice comes in. And how do you, how do you, you calm that? At one point, it was get rid of it, get rid of that voice. And we used to do affirmations and do everything we possibly could to get rid of that critical voice. And then it was Ram Dass who said, no, he said, embrace it. It's a part of you that is hurt. 
not a part of you that, that needs to be fixed. It needs to be healed. Embrace it. When the critical voice raises up its ugly head and starts uh, condemning you for one thing or another, you treat it like you would a crying baby. You say, it's okay, it's okay, we're moving on. So not only the self, but the existence that we've been given, that's another thing. We have so many comparisons and so many competitions in this world that we think if we're not a certain size, if we're not a certain shape, if we're not of a certain uh, intellectual level, that we're not as good as, as somebody else, and that's not true at all. We're all unique. We're put together in this incredible, miraculous way where there's never been anybody like any one of us in the past. There'll never be like any one of us in the future. We are that unique. Not one in a million, not one in a billion, one in 50 billion. Nobody is like you. And when we get rid of, uh, take the cloak off that hides us and disguises us because we're afraid the real world might see what we think we are, then we find the freedom to go forth and just be ourselves if there's a critical voice we just bless them and continue on. Hmm? Me? Yeah. <laughs> I think I'm beginning to understand what it, uh, what it is to start to love yourself. It's always been sort of a foreign concept. Like, what does that even mean? Mm -hmm. um, and I think what I'm, what I'm beginning to learn is... Uh, you know, and you talk about this. If I start to think about, well, if I start to look at my thoughts, get still enough to look at what I'm thinking, that's, that's the value of meditation for me. Get still enough to see what the thoughts are. And the vast majority of my thoughts are critical, uh, negative, um, and they start with me. It's a, it's a heavy focus on mm -hmm. what I've done, the mistakes I've made. With, you know, like, I never intentionally did that, but I never intentionally didn't do that. I mean, I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And again, exhausting. But if you don't know, I guess that, you know, when we talk about consciousness, being conscious of what those thoughts are, if you don't know that you're doing that to yourself, really... It stands to reason you're not going to like yourself very much. Mm -hmm. That just sort of makes sense. If you were saying these things to me, I pro you know, I, I might stop talking to you, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. But you can't stop talking. I mean, you can stop talking to yourself. I guess people, it, there are ways to do it. You could use chemicals or something. I mean, like, you can do something to s shut it all down. But it just comes back with a vengeance. So um, allowing those thoughts but adding this piece of curiosity. Huh, that's interesting that I keep saying that self, you know, that, that same thing to myself. What is it? I was talking about doing this talk today, and, um, the, you know, the term imposter syndrome came up. Um, because I, and I, I think a lot of people can relate to this. You think that other people know more than you do, therefore, mm -hmm. I don't belong in that conversation, when none of that is true. I mean, sure, it's true that some people might outfact you or have more experience in a certain area or any of that. I mean, I guess I'll use kind of an example or an analogy where, when it comes to food. If I go over to someplace, you know, somebody's house for dinner, um, most of the time, a lot of the time, there's a, there's a comment like, oh, I don't want to cook with you there. Like, oh, like I, like I somehow have the, I get what they're saying, though. Mm -hmm. I get what they're saying. I'm not critical of other people's food. The, the, the food I'm critical of is mine. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll, I'll chop that up in a million different uh, pieces after I do it, you know, just went where, what, what went wrong. Uh, uh, Rarely do I focus on what went right. Um, so that relationship with myself is an is an ongoing an ongoing relationship, um, and an and an interesting one. But I think when you 
when I start to get critical or when anyone starts to get critical, a good tool to use is to, is to look at that with curiosity and then let it go. Mm -hmm. Let it go and replace it with something else. If it's what you're getting from outside, maybe shift where you're hanging out. So do you feel that, that you are responsible for every single thing that you feel? Yes. Yeah, I do too. You know, we have a tendency to push it out there and blame somebody else and sure. stick it on them. But if I'm feeling a certain way, that's the way I have decided to feel. No matter what somebody else says, I am choosing to feel like I'm not worthy. I'm feeling to feel like I'm, I'm agitated or irritated about what's going on. But I have to take responsibility for that. Mm -hmm. Nobody else can. So we have three different things that we've identified so far. The situations and circumstances of life that we come across. And I think we both agreed that the thing you do there, if you can do something about it to improve it, do it. And if you can't, just continue to move on. The second thing is other people, realizing that everybody has their own story. And if somebody's cantankerous or belligerent or obnoxious, whatever it is, it's not our fault. It's something that, that they've gone through and uh, the, the life has shaped them into that. And then the third thing is ourselves. But the most important thing is we have this tendency to think that we're, that we're graduates of life, and I say this all the time, that I should know it all by now, that I should have it down, that I'm ready to graduate and be completely into my selfhood. But we're students of life, and we're still on the path, and, and that path never ends. We continually evolve forward, and we become more knowledgeable, and we become more spiritual, and we become more, more sensitive. But nevertheless, we're still on that uh, educational path that life uh, presents us different things that we need to learn, each of us individually. I think that about, do you have anything final to say to wrap this up? I don't up? think so, other okay. than thank you to you and everybody else. Yes, uh, Lisa Burgess. <laughs> you can go back there. We're gonna take a minute to move into meditation now, so I invite you to get comfortable. Take a deep breath and slowly exhale. Just breathe in, hold it for a moment or two, and breathe out. Your know, life is what life is. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it seems bad, sometimes it seems ugly. But it is what it is. And each and every one of us has a capacity to live this life with a strong sense of peace and a sense of harmony and a sense of love. As we do to move down the path, we understand that we have every single thing we need to live this life with a strong sense of well-being. And when that is disrupted, it means one thing that we have a lesson to learn. What can I learn here so that I don't react this way in the future? It all narrows down to peaceful mind, peaceful heart, and peaceful spirit. If we take those words into the silence, peaceful mind, peaceful heart, peaceful spirit.
that beautiful sound of a baby expressing itself to the world is beautiful because that child has no low self-esteem. That child has no difficult memories from the past. She has no fears or anxieties about the future. She is just here, present moment, right now. And when she expresses herself, it's simply because she needs something. She needs to be held differently, might need to eat. But she's just a child. In many ways, we're like that as well. When we walk away from the attitudes we have that condemn life or that have wounded us from the past or that we're afraid of in the future, when we walk away from that, we decide in the present moment, everything is fine. Everything's okay. We're okay. Other people are okay. And the world is okay. And so we truly do go forth with a peaceful mind, a peaceful heart, and a peaceful spirit. And so it is. Join in the festival of life. Join in the festival of life. Dance to the rhythm of life's own song. For love will guide your movement. So open up your hearts and let your spirits fly. Open up your hearts and let your spirits fly. God shall get them that God shall lose. So the boy and it's there is news. Your mama may That's God is all that's God is all. Yes, the strong gets more while the weak ones fail. Yo 
Millie Edwards. Well, this concludes our service. We do have receptacles in the um, narthex, the outer lobby. If you'd like to leave a donation, we certainly appreciate it. We'll close it. Oh, also, Lisa Burgess will be downstairs after the service to greet you, but she'll also be on the stage for some of you that don't want to go down. So we'll now close the service with the prayer of protection and the peace song. Together, the light of God surrounds us, the love of God enfolds us, the power of God protects us. The presence of God watches over us. Wherever we are, God is and all is well.